بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد We're still talking about the incidents that happened right after the emigration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and before we move on uh, there's an interesting anecdote or an interesting um, uh, important milestone in our history that is not related directly to the incidents of the Hijrah but it is very important for our history and that is the establishment of the calendar based upon the Hijrah. This establishment of the calendar of course didn't take place right now, it took place a decade and a half later. But because it deals with the Hijrah, I thought I'd just mention it two, three minutes and then uh, move on because we're talking about the Hijrah, we're talking about the importance of the Hijrah. Now realize that the Arabs did not have a calendar that they would rely upon. The Romans had a calendar, the Persians had a calendar, the Arabs had no such calendar. A sign of civilization is to have a calendar and the Arabs did not reach those limits of civilization as we had said many times before, they didn't have a script, they didn't have a civilization, they didn't have architecture, all of this, uh, that's the whole miracle of the religion of Islam, that it came and it transformed this Bedouin backward, uncultivated society to become the rulers of the entire world. And I have mentioned many times, and Allah mentions this in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ We have revealed a book, in it will be your remembrance, your legacy. Your legacy will be established via the book. So, of the uh, legacies that Islam came with was the establishment of a calendar. So the Arabs, as we said, they, they had multiple problems, problems. Number one, they didn't have a calendar. So every tribe would have their own calendar system, believe it or not. Every tribe would have their own calendar system. How so? So the Quraysh would have their own calendar based upon important events. Somebody dies, they will say the death of so-and-so. This is the year now, right? And every few years something significant would happen. So they would say two years after the death of the chieftain. Three years before the incident of the elephant. This is how they would have calendar years. Any important incident becomes a milestone and every few years some milestone happens. So then they calculate basically based upon this milestone uh, major incidents and events. Now this is of course local, it's decentralized which means every qabila or every tribe has its own significant incident because they're not all unified under uh, uh, all of Arabia. To compound matters, there was also a very confusing practice that they had, which Allah mentions in the Quran. إِنَّمَا النَّسِي أُزِيَادَةٌ فِي الْكُفْرِ This is the concept of nasi. And an nasi, Allah mentions it in the Quran. Uh, in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah revealed down the sharia that four months of the year will be sacred. This is what the Arabs took from Ibrahim alayhi salam. Four months of the year will be sacred. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمٌ There is a verse in the Quran that tells us, Surah Tawbah, that the, the number of months in a year in the eyes of Allah is twelve. إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ This is in the decree of Allah, the day He created the heavens and the earth. Of them, four are sacred. So Allah decreed this the day He created the heavens and the earth, that the calendar shall have 12 months. And that is why, by the way, every significant calendar on the face of this world has had 12, because it's in their fitra. From, not, well, fitra isn't proper here. It's in the sharia of the earliest prophets, let's say. Every calendar, where did the Romans get 12? Where did the Chinese get 12? Where did the, uh, the, 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 the Fadis or the, the, the Persians get 12? All of this, it goes back to the original sharia that Allah revealed down. 12 was there from the beginning. And also, by the way, seven days of the week is also uh, in that sharia and therefore every calendar system basically that is an acceptance has seven days of a week. This is something that again Allah Azza wa Jal decreed. So the Arabs also had 12 months and four of them were hurum, were sacred. But the powerful tribes and especially the Quraysh was the most powerful, they would flaunt these four months. Suppose they wanted to declare war and it just so happened that it's the wrong month, right? Because the four sacred months you cannot declare war. You cannot engage in fighting. Suppose they wanted to do that. What would they do? They would say, you know, instead of Muharram right now, it's Safar. They just swap it around, right? It's actually not Dhul Qa'da now, it's Dhul Hijjah. They'll just swap it around, right? And because they had this clout, the powerful tribes could basically tell the people, look, this is not the month we're going to follow the sacred month. We'll just swap it around and if we want to attack, we can attack you. And they would then announce this and the other tribes would pay heed to this. So 
uh, the other tribes would therefore realize that, okay, this is not a sacred month, maybe we shouldn't go do Hajj this year. So literally, they would swap months around at whim and at desire. And Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا النَّسِيءُ زِيَادَةٌ فِي الْكُفْرِ Allah calls it a type of kufr, which is ungratefulness and a rejection of Allah's sharia. إِنَّمَا النَّسِيءُ زِيَادَةٌ فِي الْكُفْرِ That this concept of nasi, which is uh, to swap the months around, this is a type of rejection of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, imagine what's going to happen after decades and centuries of swapping months around, that the entire months are going to be jumbled up like a jigsaw puzzle. And nobody has any idea what month should it actually be. It would literally be swapping at will and desire. And so the months lost the significance of their tartib, of their order that they used to have. Because this is what's going to happen if you keep on changing at will. So the year that the Prophet ﷺ performed Hajj, the Hajjat al Wada, he announced to the people that the months of this year, meaning Hajjat al Wada's year, Right? Which year is Hajjat al Wada'? Which year of the Hijrah? The 10th of the Hijrah. The 10th year of the Hijrah. Of course, it's not 10 Hijrah yet, meaning the concept of 10 years after Hijrah doesn't exist. But the months exist. So the Prophet ﷺ said, This year, the months have fallen in order the way that they were when Allah created the heavens and the earth. This is a hadith in Bukhari. That this year's 12 months are perfectly aligned. So the Prophet ﷺ said this, right? And he then said, from now on, no swapping. Khalas, and no more swapping. So from that time up until our times, the months have been in their proper order. Because Allah willed that in that year, the months go in their proper order. And then the Prophet said, this was the correct order. No more switching around, right? So there, therefore, from that year, those months have basically been re repeating one after the other. Okay? So that's one problem taken care of. And that's the order of the months. The other problem is the year that the Prophet himself did not directly allude to. He didn't directly institute a calendar. What happened was one year, uh, most likely this is the 17th year of the Hijra that we now call 17th year. What happened was in the 17th year uh, of the Hijrah, one or two things happened. One thing that happened was that Umar ibn al-Khattab was presented with a case of two people fighting each other and uh, in a court of law. And the one of them said that he was supposed to pay me back money by Sha'ban and it's already Ramadan. He didn't give me my money back. And the other said, no, I meant Sha'ban of next year, not this year. So Umar says, how are we going to decide this dispute? Because the contract says Sha'ban. And each one has a valid point, right? So Allah knows, maybe both of them were honest in this. Allah knows best. One of them, when he said, pay me back by Sha'ban, he meant maybe in two, three months. And the other guy's thinking, two, three months, no, I'm the next Sha'ban, next year Sha'ban. So Umar was presented with this. And this caused some problems, like this is a valid problem. And then he got a letter, it is said from Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, or one of his governors, who says basically a similar thing, that, O oh Umar, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, sometimes you tell us to do something by a particular month, a major project, let's say, build this dam or do this or that. And you tell us to do it by a particular month, but we don't know, do you mean the same year or the next year's month? Right? Same, the same issue, basically. We don't know. So find a way to tell us, basically. And so Umar radiallahu an called a gathering of the Sahaba that we need to have a calendar. And this happened in the 17th year of the Hijrah. So one or two suggested we'll follow the calendar of the Romans or the Persians. And of course this was immediately rejected because the Muslims realized they have their own civilization now. You don't need to be following others when you are at your pinnacle. It is only at times of weakness where we follow everybody else and this is the reality of life. Once upon a time they didn't, they felt that they have no need. So Umar said no, we will have our own calendar. So which year should we begin with? So, uh, the Sahaba differed, one of them said with the death of the Prophet ﷺ, but this was then to say, no, this is not uh, appropriate, and a sad time, you want to mark the calendar day. Another said with the, uh, one person did it said, said with the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, another said with the conquest of Badr, because that was the day that Allah gave victory over the, the, the pagans, the decisive victory. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib said, the year of the Hijrah shall be the first year of the calendar, because this was when the situation of the Muslims changed from Dhul to Izzah. 
from being humiliated to being honored. This was the one decisive thing in the whole seerah that uh, was the turning point of the uh, basically the, the new leaf. The optimism begins with uh, the hijrah. And so when he said this, the Sahaba all agreed to this. And Umar said, this is the correct opinion. I mean, this is the Ra'ya al this is the, uh, the, the wise opinion. This is the, the good opinion. And so they decided the first year of the Islamic calendar will be the year of the hijrah. Once again, realize there's no zero year. He, there is no zero time. Hijrah, first year Hijrah. Before this, we call it before Hijrah, basically, right? So it's, uh, we call it, let's say, 12 before Hijrah. Then uh, uh, this year becomes the first year of the Hijrah, 1AH. Now, the second issue, which month should be taken as the first month? Because when you have a calendar, now for the first time, you need to figure out which month of the, uh, should begin your first month. So once again, people differed. Some said Ramadan, because Ramadan is the most uh, holy month, right? Uh, others said uh, Dhul Hijjah because Dhul Hijjah is the month of Hajj, right? Others said Rajab because Rajab is also has its blessings. There's two or three opinions until Uthman ibn Affan said it shall be Muharram. Why? Why Muharram? Uh, scholars have differed because this is a bit uh, difficult to try to read in why uh, Muharram. Uh, two reasons have been given by our classical scholars. The first of them is that it's linked to Ali's announcement of the Hijrah being the first year. And that is that the actual Hijrah, which month did it occur? Who reminds who can remind me? Which month did the Prophet emigrate? Incorrect. Shawwal. Where'd you get Shawwal from? Shawwal is huh? Shawwal is after uh, Ramadan, right? The Hajj. He always said Rabi al Awal. Safar. Why do you say Safar? Because it took them about 10 to 12 weeks to reach. Weeks? Days. 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 And when did they arrive in Medina? Around 8th or 9th of Rabi al Awal. Exactly. You see? So the. Not Shawwal. Safar. Right? The S, oh mashallah, okay, yes. he had the S right, mashallah. The only problem is in Arabic it's a sheen, not an S. <laughs> this, is the, this is the American in you speaking, mashallah. The S is the first letter of the month. I had one letter right, mashallah, alhamdulillah. Uh, so the month was Safar. The actual month of Hijrah was Safar. That's when the process of emigrated. So why not choose Safar? Well, one opinion says the announcement for the Hijrah came in Muharram. I.e. the Bay'atul Aqaba, when did it take place? After Hajj. And Hajj is Dhul Hijjah, right? So when did the announcement come for the people to start doing Hijrah? Basically in Muharram, right? So this is one opinion that that's why Muharram was chosen. Because the announcement for Hijrah was done and so people began emigrating in Muharram. The bulk of the Sahaba emigrated in Muharram and then the Prophet emigrated right at the end of Safar, right? So those seven, eight weeks the Sahaba are migrating and all of them basically leave. Only the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Ali and a few people remain. That's at the end of Safar, then he migrates. So this is one opinion. And there is another opinion which actually, now this makes a lot of sense logically. We'd love to pounce on it. Uh, however, there are some reports that it, in which Uthman expresses a reason. And Allah knows best. It could have been both. And his reason was that now in those days, yani mashallah, the Sahaba, they did Hajj pretty much every year. Pretty much every year they did Hajj. Yani most of them, yani they either in Mecca or Medina, so Hajj is like an annual event. And so uh, for them, returning back from Hajj represents a new life. That represents a new turning over, a better life, right? You leave a life of sins, you now move on to a better life, okay? So the coming back from Hajj represents a fresh beginning. And when do you come back from Hajj? Well, at the end of Dhul Hijjah. So what month begins the, that new life? Muharram, right? And so this seems to be also a very uh, relevant reason why they began the months with uh, Muharram. And Later scholars, I didn't find this amongst the Sahaba, I didn't find this amongst the people who did this. Umar and, and Ali and others did not, uh, from my understanding, say this. However, later scholars tried to read in a Quranic evidence for this being uh, the first of the Hijrah, right? And this is a bit of an imaginative stretch. Nonetheless, we don't lose anything by, by saying perhaps this is also the case. And that is Surah Tawbah, verse 108. Surah Tawbah, verse 108, we already quoted the verse before. لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَىٰ 
min awwali yawmin ahqqu an taquma fi right the masjid that was built in the first day that is the masjid that you should be praying in and so masjid quba was built basically in the first year of the hijra so it's a little bit of a stretch right but nonetheless so they're saying allah says the first day min awwali yawm and uh, therefore they're kind of reading this in and they say so Allah is intending that that should be the first day of the Islamic calendar or the first year of the Islamic calendar and this is something some of our classical scholars said and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about this anyway so the issue of the hijra the point why I'm mentioning this now is to show you the Sahaba understood the significance of the Hijrah. That all of the other opinions are being basically, you know, so-so, uh, not really being taken seriously. When the Hijrah is suggested, everybody agrees. And they said, this is the most logical place to where we should begin our Islamic uh, calendar. Now, uh, again, before we move on, a little bit of a summary now. The Madani period, of course... Uh, we know that the Madani period is shorter than the Meccan era. The Meccan era lasted 13 years, the Madani lasted 10 years. The Madani period can be divided into three very clear eras or categories. The Madani era can be split up into three. The first is the era of consolidation, the era of strengthening, the era of internal uh, dissent being uh, eliminated. And there were internal uh, dissents from both the hypocrites and the, uh, the Yahud. These are the two major points of weakness. And also, by the way, they're also pagans in the beginning. Slowly but surely, the pagans are eliminated. The hypocrites are basically um, minimized. They are not eliminated. And then the Yahud as well are expelled or they're also uh, eliminated in the end. And so uh, the Muslims were facing internal threats and they were also facing external threats. And the external threats primarily were from the Quraysh. So the first era was the elimination of any serious threat. The elimination of any serious threat and the Muslim Ummah or the Republic, if you like, can stand confidently independent of any serious problems. And this era is from the beginning of the Hijrah up until uh, basically the, the Battle of Ahzab is when the tables really began to turn. The Battle of Ahzab marks the beginning of complete change. That's the fifth year of the Hijrah, right? So from the first to the fifth, internal and external opposition is either eliminated or minimized to the extent that the, th the existence of the Islamic State is no longer in threat. You see in the Battle of Badr, what did the Prophet say? He said to Allah, he's speaking to Allah, Oh Allah, Ya Allah, in tuhlika hadhihi al-isaba, if this group is destroyed, فَلَن تُعْبَدَ فِي الْأَرْضِ You will not be worshipped on earth ever again. The existence of the Ummah is under threat right now, right? If this group is destroyed now, if you allow these people to win, then you will not be worshipped on earth. Right? That is how serious of a threat the Muslims were in. The battle of Uhud was another serious threat. The battle of Khandaq, they were almost about to be Eliminated, but of course Allah protected them. And when He protected them, the destruction of the opponents was so total that the tide begins to change. Right? Literally, the Battle of Ahzab is going to come to it. That is the beginning of the, the, the tide changing. And their confidence begins. And therefore, the next year, what did the Prophet say? We are going to march to Mecca for Umrah. This is confidence coming now. Right? That's the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So, this is the first era. And this is uh, a lot of internal and external threats are eliminated or minimized. The second era is the era of truce. And this lasted two and a half years from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, basically, up until the conquest of Mecca. The, the, the uh, era of truce. And in this era, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims witnessed a peace along with the coexistence of non-Muslims. Unlike the third era in which there is no non-Muslim in Mecca or in Arabia, right? In this time frame, both Islam and the enemies of Islam are on the Arabian Peninsula but at peace with one another. <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ is sending out letters, emissaries, envoys. The Muslim Ummah expands fivefold in the era of peace. Much more than it expanded in the era of war. And we'll talk about that when we get there, right? And that is the 6th, 7th, and 8th years of the Hijrah, basically. And then the final era 
is the era of the complete establishment of, uh, of the Republic of Islam or the early Islamic Republic and that is basically the post-conquest of Mecca up until the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Rabi' al-Awwal of the 11th year of the Hijrah and that was when Allah revealed وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا That is the ultimate victory that the entire peninsula embraced Islam and mass. These are the three primary frames that we will divide the rest of our uh, entire higher lectures uh, in. I've already mentioned many times before the Madani era even though it is shorter than the Makki era. The Makki era we've already discussed 43 years of the Hijrah. Sorry, 53 years of the Hijrah. We have discussed 53 years of the Prophet's life, وسلم, not Hijrah. 53 years of the Prophet's life. We are now done with that. The amount of information we have for these last 10 years is three times the amount that we have for the first 53 years. So we're going to spend quite a lot of time. Uh, just FYI, I have taught the seerah uh, three different times, actually four different times, in four different places. I have never actually finished because every time I started, I never lived in that city long enough. The brother here used to attend mine in Connecticut for a number of, of years, and Allah will that I move here. So let's make dua that I'm able to finish this for the first time. I've never actually finished the seerah. Uh, in these types of lectures because uh, it's so long we move on so inshallah let's see how many lessons we're going to do uh, and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, knows the end of affairs inshallah <laughs> inshallah it will be a first I have not done this uh, before inshallah uh, so let's move back now to uh, the Sahaba in Medina the Sahaba in Medina how did the early emigrants how did the Muhajirun find the environment how did they, how did they like Medina. Well, the fact of the matter is, despite all of the praise that we've given, the early Muhajirun did not like Medina. Not because of anything problematic with Medina, but because they missed home. Because there is truly no place like home. Wallahi, this is so true. There is no place like home. It doesn't matter how fancy of a place you go to. It doesn't matter, you know, how royally you're treated at somebody else's abode. Your house, the comfort you feel in your house. I mean, all of you know, you go to the fanciest hotel. It's nice to look around. It's nice to see the room. But your lumpy bed with the, uh, with the, t with the, the, the pillow that's already mashed up and this, that comfort that you get there, you are not going to get it even in the fanciest hotel. This is the reality that we all know, right? And this is also the environment as well, the city, the people. And so the Muhajirun felt so homesick, they fell sick. Literally, they fell sick. Literally, they fell sick. And Aisha narrates, she's a young girl now. Aisha narrates, and, and she has been married to the Prophet Sallam, that when uh, Abu Bakr, my father, and Bilal emigrated to uh, Medina, when they emigrated to Medina, I went and visited them because she's now with the Prophet I went and visited them and I said, Ya Abati, kayfa tajiduk? How, how are you, O oh my father? And uh, Bilal was with him as well. And Bilal, how are you? And they, uh, she said that both of them were basically moaning and Abu Bakr was in a severe fever. And Abu Bakr was sweating and in a fever. And uh, he said, uh, He's thinking of death, basically, right? That we wake up amongst our family, but the fact of the matter is death is closer to us than our shoes, our shoelaces. Not even our shoelace, but um, the strap that the sandal has over your toe, right? This is the shirak. And so he's saying, yani, my point is he's so sick, he's thinking of death, basically, right? And he's just emigrated to Medina, and he's thinking of death. And so Aisha says, Bilal, how are you? And so uh, Bilal also said some poetry. How I wish, how I wish that I would spend the night in a valley full of idhkhar and jalil, which are the thorny plants outside of Mecca. He is in a plant of uh, a land of dates, a land of water, a land that generally speaking is considered more luscious than Mecca. But he's missing the thorns of Mecca. He's missing the, 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 the dryness of Mecca, right? Because he's used to it, right? He's used to, uh, he's used to that land of Mecca. And uh, Bilal said to Aisha, Allahum mal'an, Shaybat ibn Rabi'ah. Allahum mal'an, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Allahum mal'an, and he goes starring la'na, Allah's la'na, on all of these people. Why? Because akhrajuna min diyarina. They kicked us out of our houses, right? He's fuming with anger. And this is Bilal who didn't own much at all, but it's the place, right? It's natural 
to love the place you grow up in. It's natural to feel a sense of solidarity, a sense of homesickness basically. And this is Abu Bakr and Bilal, they are both homesick. One of them is severely sick. So Aisha says, I went back to the process of that depressing scene basically, right? She goes back and she informs him about what's going on. And so uh, the Prophet made a special dua for all of the Muhajirun. What is the dua? Allahumma habib ilayna al-madinata ka hubbina makkata aw ashaddu. You have to make a special dua to Allah. Subhanallah. What was the dua? Allahumma habib ilayna al-madinata. Oh Allah, make Medina beloved to us. Like we used to love Makkah or even more than we used to love Makkah. Or even more than we used to love Mecca. Oh Allah, bless us in our food measurements. Sa'ina wa muddina. Meaning, what does this mean? Of course, in those days, you would buy everything with a sa'ina mud, which means yani the, the scoop, let's say, right? So everything that that scoop will scoop up, oh Allah, bless us. Meaning all of the food supplies of Medina, right? Oh Allah, take the bad weather and the, bla the bad diseases and plagues. Now Medina had more water and more lusciousness, so there's more plagues, microbes, whatever you want to call it. The doctors will tell me more about how this happens, but Medina has more plagues than Makkah, right? Makkah for them was healthier because it was drier, because it was less uh, water there. And so they're falling sick. They're not used to uh, the, 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 the fevers of Medina. So the Prophet said, Oh Allah, remove all of the plagues of, and the fevers of Medina and uh, throw it outside of Medina in the barren land of Juhfa, which is a barren land outside. Just let it go over there. Let us, let us not uh, suffer from it. And so slow, slowly but surely, the love of Medina entered their hearts because the Prophet made this dua. The love of Medina entered their hearts so much so that when the Prophet uh, would go away from Medina, the Sahaba would count the days they're going to come back to Medina. And when, it is said, Anas ibn Malik tells us in the Hadith of Bukhari, when the Prophet would see Medina in the distance, he would cheer up and he would make his camel go faster. That yes, it's in the distance, let's get there faster. SubhanAllah, he made this dua to Allah. And uh, one can say to this day, I mean, I have lived in Medina, the love that we have for Medina is a very different love than Mecca. We love Mecca, Alhamdulillah, Mecca is Mecca. But the love of Medina, the peace of Medina, the sukoon of Medina, wallahi, it is something yani, very different. And I, I firmly believe it is this dua of the Prophet. The Prophet is telling all the Muslims, Oh Allah, make them love Medina. Make them love Medina, especially the Sahaba, but in all of the Muslims. Make them love Medina. And it is so true, brothers and sisters, that even those who have never visited Medina, they have an emptiness they want to visit. Those who have visited it, their memories of Medina are very sweet and different. Not that Astaghfirullah Makkah doesn't have its memories. Makkah has its memories and Makkah has its izzah. But the sweetness of Medina is different. And this is what the Prophet is saying, Habib ilayna al-Medina ka hubbina makkata aw ashaddu. And so he made this special dua for Medina. And of course Allah answered that dua. And therefore the Sahaba began loving Medina even more than they used to love uh, Mecca. Of the early things that the Prophet ﷺ did, so much so that according to one uh, of the early scholars of Sirah, he did this even before the masjid was built was he did the famous, it's called Mu'akha. And Mu'akha means making people akhi. Mu'akha means making people brothers. Right? Al-Mu'akha. He made a Mu'akha, a brotherly bond between the Muhajirun and the Ansar. Despite the fact that he had already encouraged the Ansar to be generous and the Ansar were generous. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the generosity of the Ansar. I already mentioned this verse in the Quran, Surah Al Hashr, verse 8 and 9. Surah Al Hashr, verse 8 and 9, it describes the generosity of the Ansar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this emigration. And Allah says, uh, للفقراء المهاجرين الذين أحصل الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم وأموالهم يبتغون فضل من الله ورضوانه that for those poor people of the muhajirin because all of the muhajirin were poor none of them had the money that they had in مكة so Allah calls all of the muhajirin فقراء look at this للفقراء المهاجرين every muhajir by virtue of his hijra became فقير so Allah calls all of them fuqara. Allah is saying they will have their reward and they will have Allah's pleasure. Then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُ الدَّارِ Now we get to the Ansar. The Muhajir will have their reward. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ And those who prepared the abode, ad-dar. Notice Allah, what does ad-dar mean? It means home. Dari is my home. 
Allah called Medina their home. This is an interesting noun to use, that he didn't say Medina. He didn't say the city's name, even though the Quran mentions Medina, right? Uh, and the Quran mentions the Munafiqun calling it Yathrib as well, right? Yathrib ala muqam lakum farju'u the Munafiqun. By the way, every time the word Yathrib occurs in the Quran, it is at the tongues of the Munafiq. Allah never calls Medina Yathrib, right? Allah never calls Medina Yathrib. Yathrib occurs, I think, twice in the Quran. Both of the times it on, on the tongue of the hypocrites, right? They are the ones who are calling Medina Yathrib, which means we should not call it Yathrib. Now, in this verse, Allah uses a noun for Medina that He doesn't use anywhere else, and that is the house, he, or the abode. So He is calling Medina your house. Meaning, this is where you're going to feel at home. This is where you're going to feel the most comfort. And Allah calls the Ansar, those who prepared the house, not their house, the house. What's the difference here? It is technically the house of the Ansar. And so if Allah had said those who had prepared their house, this would have been accurate. But Allah didn't. Because what did the Ansar do? They gave up half of their house to the Muhajirun. So Allah called the Medina the house of the Ansar and the Muhajirun. Are you following this or am I... I'm going a little bit too fast, I think, right? Ad-Dar is a reference to both the Muhajirun and the Ansar. That Allah is calling it both of your houses, even though technically it's the house of the Ansar. Allah is saying the Ansar prepared the house for them. And they found no hesitancy to give everything. And they preferred others over themselves. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا Even if they themselves were in poverty, they preferred others over themselves. And so they gave the Muhajirun everything they needed from home to food to animals. It is even reported in Sahih Bukhari that when the Muhajirun came, they came to the Prophet ﷺ, the Ansar came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, O Messenger of Allah, we shall give half of our land over to the Muhajirun. Half of the land of the Medina, give it over to the Muhajirun. Can you imagine all of the date palms, all of just half, khalas, take it for free. Not one thing in return. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for them, but he refused to, he refused to accept such a generous gift. He refused to accept such a generous gift. And he said, they will take care of the manual labor. And you will share in the produce. I.e., let them do work for the dates and for the privilege. And subhanAllah, this shows us the spirit of Islam. That the Prophet ﷺ did not want these free handouts. He wanted the Muhajirun to work. And he also didn't want shaitan to maybe bring something five generations or five decades later. Oh, we gave you all of this for free. You never know. If these people, of course, they had pure hearts. How about their descendants? Right? Or how about the munafiqun who were forced to give, maybe? So, this is the long-term thinking of the Prophet to cut off these free handouts. Even though it's such a generous gift, take half the land. The Prophet said, no. They shall do work. They're going to do their manual labor. You get some time off now. You can, if you're going to let them do the work, then they can take a percentage for their manual labor. Right? They'll take their wages in date and in food, and you can take your wages or your percentage as well. And so the Prophet did not uh, uh, allow this to be done and instead he insisted that the Muhajirun work for the Ansar to get their money. And also the Prophet insisted and encouraged them to be generous to one another. Uh, you all know the famous first hadith uh, of uh, Medina. It is the first hadith that is narrated from Medina and it is a hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam. And he is the Jewish rabbi who converted to Islam uh, and he was the greatest of the Jewish rabbis and one of the only ones to convert to Islam. And uh, Abdullah ibn Salam narrates uh, that when the Prophet entered Medina, the people rushed to take a look at him. The people rushed to take a look at him. And I was of the first who arrived. So this is like the first time that the Prophet ﷺ, this is in Quba, of course. The first time that the Prophet ﷺ is coming to Medina. And he said, فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَتْ وَجْهُهُ When his face became clear to us, meaning when he was close up, عَرَفْتُ أَنَّ وَجْهَهُ لَيْسَ بِوَجْهِ كَذَّابَ This hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmad. He said, as soon as I saw his face clearly, I knew that this face was not the face of a liar. 
Just by looking at his face, he said, I know that this face is not the face of a liar. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal allows righteousness and piety to show in a, in, a, in a way that we'll never understand. And Allah also allows insincerity and evil to show in a way that we will never understand. So pure people can sense pure people. And this in Arabic is called firasa. And the Prophet said, firasa is true. اتقوا فراسة المؤمن فإن فراسته حق that the firasa is true. So Abdullah ibn Salam, because he is a pure Yahudi, that he was a genuine believer and he accepted Islam, he sensed this purity. So he said, I saw that his face was not that of a liar. And he said, the first thing that I heard him say was, أفشو السلام وأطعم الطعام وصلوا الأرحام وصلوا بالليل والناس نيام تدخل الجنة بسلام. And the hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Salam and is called Hadith al-Salam. It is called Hadith al-Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam narrates the hadith of peace in which the Prophet ﷺ says, the first hadith of Medina, أفشو السلام. Spread the greetings of salam everywhere. Afshu salam. Wa at'imu ta'am. Feed the people. Anybody who needs food, give it to them. Wa at'imu ta'am. Wa silu al-arham. Be good to your relatives. Wa sallu bil layli wa nasu niyam. And pray at night when everybody is asleep. Tadkhulu al-jannata bi salam. You will enter jannah with peace. And so the Prophet is encouraging being brotherly, being kind, being generous. He's encouraging these things from day one. But he went a step further than this, and that is he instituted the concept of mu'akha, which means every muhajir was paired with an ansari. And in this stage, the pairing was so complete that they would be considered like brothers, even in inheritance. This is an early stage, that if one of them died, the other would inherit his money. This was of course later abrogated. But this was the extent of the brotherliness that they had. That they would even become brothers in inheritance. And it is mentioned that over 100 such pairs were done. Which basically means for every single uh, male muhajir, there was a pair done. Right? For every single male muhajir, there was a pair done. At least we know for a fact, 100 names we have. And for sure we have some names that have been lost in history. More than 100 such pairs were done. And uh, we have some pairs that we know of. Abu Bakr was with Khalid ibn Zayd. Uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was with uh, Sa'ad ibn al-Rabi'ah. And whoever you find, by the way, uh, so for example, Salman al-Farsi was with Abu Darda. Every time you find a pairing, if you look at their biographies, you actually find a lot in common. You actually find a lot in common. So Kharija ibn Zayd was one of the uh, was one of the noblemen of the Ansar. And Abu Bakr, you know who he is. So the Prophet ﷺ paired them together. Sa'd ibn al-Rabi' was a rich businessman. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf used to be rich in Mecca. Right? When he migrated, he has nothing now. But businessmen, they know business together, right? So the Prophet ﷺ knows exactly who he's pairing with who. And he chooses the right person to pair. Every single one that we find, we find a good uh, pair done. And every one of these names, every one of these names uh, that have been paired together, we actually find them mentioned in the seerah many times together. Which means that they took this pairing together very seriously. That they literally became like brothers to one another. For example, the famous incident that all of you know, Abu Darda visited, Salman al-Farsi, sorry, visited Abu Darda's house. And this was before the hijab came down. And he saw his wife disheveled and not combing her hair. And uh, this is before hijab. And also, by the way, Salman is at this stage 90 years old anyway. So it's not any problem uh, that he saw her with her hair uncovered, unkempt. Uh, and she's not uh, dressed properly. Meaning, yeah, any old tattered clothes. And he reproached her. He's like, how can you dress like this? My, uh, yeah, my, uh, my, my brother should not see you like this. Meaning you should dress up a little bit for your husband. So Umm Darda says, your brother has no need of women. Yeah, and there's no need for me to dress up. He, by the way, as, as I said, firstly, this is before hijab. Secondly, Salman himself is, uh, it is said he died at the age of 120. Uh, Allah knows best. But basically, he's a very, very old man. Uh, and so there's no problem in him reproaching in this manner uh, for both of these reasons. Uh, and then the hadith goes on when, when he comes home, Abu Darda is fasting. Salman says, you're going to break your fast, eat with me. When he tries to go to sleep, Abu Darda stands in tahajjud. Salman says, no, you're going to go and lie down next to me. You're not going to pray tahajjud now. You all know the story, right? This is the famous story. These are the two who have been paired together. Salman and Abu Darda. This is the process and paired them together. Same with Abu Bakr and Khalid ibn Zayd, we have incidents together. Same with Abdurrahman ibn Auf and Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah. Point is, the brotherliness wasn't just 
uh, it wasn't just superficial. We actually genuinely find stories between these two and that shows us that they hung around each other, that they had genuine feelings and concerns for one another. Of course, the most famous story that uh, everybody uh, is familiar with is the story of Abd rahman ibn Awf and Sa'ad ibn al-Rabi'ah. And Sa'ad ibn al-Rabi'ah, as we said, was a rich businessman. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, when he came uh, and the Prophet paired them together, he brought Abdul Rahman back to his house and he said, I am the richest of the Ansar in money and I shall give you half of all of my money. Take half of all of my money. And uh, in some versions he said, I have a two-story house, uh, one, of the, one of the levels is yours. And I have two gardens, one of them is yours. He even said, I have two wives. And choose one of them after her idda is done, you can marry her. He wanted to split everything down to give everything or half of everything to his new brother in Islam. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf said the famous phrase that he said, Barakallahu uh, lak fi malika wa ahlik. May Allah bless you even more in your money, in your family. I don't want any of this. Just tell me where is the supermarket? Where is the suq? Right? Where is the buying and selling place? So he was told to go to the place of the, the Yahud had a souk, uh, souk outside of Medina. And so he took some whatever he could carry on his back from the Hijrah. He bought and sold a little bit of that and he came back with uh, some uh, butter and some wheat. He came back uh, for the day and he kept on. When the next day he took that and he brought other things. And so he bartered until finally the hadith says one day uh, the Prophet saw him and he was dressed up, mashallah, and he had some perfume on. So the Prophet said, What's the matter? Or have you gotten married? He's joking with him. Have you gotten married? And he says, yes, Rasulullah, I got married, right? So like he's moving up in life. So the Prophet said, to whom? And he said, uh, to a lady of the Ansar. So he said, what did you give her? He said, I gave her a date's weight, a seed of the date's weight in gold. I.e., yani, uh, yani the seed of a date weighs how much? You know, less than an ounce or something. Yani, uh, even these days, an ounce of gold costs an arm and a leg these days, right? But, you know, it's a small bit that he gave, right? Just... Uh, Less than a gram, sorry, less than a gram. Uh, even these days, by the, by the way, you cannot even judge according to these days. Back then it was uh, uh, much less than this. So you say, uh, the point being a very trivial amount, not a few hundred dollars, just maybe twenty dollars, something like this. It's an insignificant amount I gave as mahar. So the Prophet said, Awlim walaw bishat. Do a walima, even if it's with one sheep, do a walima. Invite the people to a wedding feast. Uh, so this shows us that the Ansar and the Muhajirun, uh, their level of ukhuwa, their brotherhood was really unmatched. Notice here the generosity of the Ansadi and the self-honor of the Muhajir. This is real Iman. That the one is offering and, the, and his Iman tells him to offer. And the other's Iman is saying, Jazakallah, thanks, but no thanks, I'm going to do what I need to. Right? This is the essence of Iman. Neither one is freeloading off of the other. Neither one is, the one is offering genuinely and the other's izza, his honor, his karama says, Jazakallah, thanks but no thanks, I'm going to try my best to do my own. And so every single muhajir found uh, a person to take care of him and uh, the Ansar in fact helped the muhajirun so much that the muhajirun came to the Prophet wasallam worried about something. The muhajirun came to the Prophet wasallam worried about something. They said that, O Messenger of Allah, we have never seen any group of people like these that we have come to. They share equally with us at times of difficulty and are generous with us at times of ease. They have taken care of our needs and allowed us to share with them in good, so much so that we are worried, Ya Rasulullah. Notice, this is a complaint in the guise of a praise. Outwardly, it's praising, but inwardly, they're scared. What are they scared of? We are worried, Ya Rasulullah, that they will take all of our ajr away from us. Subhanallah. Notice the beauty of the complaint, right? That they've done so much that all of those years in Mecca that we were persecuted, all of those years that we were tortured, all of the wealth and money we had to leave behind, the hijrah and the problems of the hijrah, all of this, Ya Rasulullah, we're worried that it's all going to be handed to them because they're so nice to us. Notice, Wallahi, this is just an amazing complaint. It's not a complaint against the Ansar, obviously. It's 
a troubled worriness that they have about their own good deed. Are we still going to get the reward or not? And so the Prophet ﷺ said that no, they will not get all of your reward as long as you praise them and make dua for them. Respond to their good with your own good. They were not going to get your reward. You have your reward, they have their reward. And that is of course our religion. Every person gets rewarded according to what he has done. So what the muhajirun did cannot be just taken by the ansar. And that is why the muhajirun are at a higher level than the ansar, even after all that the ansar uh, did. And uh, we said already that the two would even inherit from one another until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Anfal after the battle of Badr. And so after the battle of Badr, which is basically a year and a half, uh, a year and a half to two years after this incident took place, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed Surah Al-Anfal and in it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, that Allah praises those who have uh, emigrated and those who have uh, 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 and those who have abandoned everything for the sake of Allah. Then Allah says, but ulul arham families are closer in the eyes of Allah than them. So in this verse, the Sahaba understood that inheritance between uh, this type of mu'akha, this type of brotherliness had been abrogated and inheritance was then instituted only for the uh, family, only for the family. Now an interesting point here is that this mu'akha or this uh, brotherliness, it didn't just take place in early Medina. It continued to take place throughout the years in Medina up until even after the conquest of Mecca. And this shows us an important point that many Muslims don't realize. Many Muslims, then when they read the books of the seerah, it says this is when the mu'akha took place. No, this is not true. The mu'akha was begun in this era. And it continued up until the very end, even after the conquest of Mecca. How do we know? By the names of the people mentioned who were paired together. So for example, Salman al-Farsi and Abu Darda. Salman al-Farsi did not... Uh, accept Islam for a few years. He didn't accept Islam right at the Hijrah. It took him a few years to accept Islam. And then the Mu'akha took place. We also have, for example, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was made a brother of Mu'adh ibn Jabal. When did Ja'far come to Medina? We already mentioned this. Who can tell me? Obviously after Habsha, but when? <laughs> Seventh year of the Hijrah. Right? So in the seventh year of the Hijrah, Ja'far comes back and still the Prophet makes Mu'akha. It is also mentioned, for example, that Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was made a brother with Hattat al Taymi, and Mu'awiyah accepted Islam after Fatih Makkah. So this shows us that the concept of pairing people together was not something that was unique only to the beginning of Islam. It lasted throughout the entire course of the Madani phase and therefore from this we extract that this is a neglected sunnah. Up until our times we should be doing this. Especially when people convert to Islam. Especially when people convert to Islam, this is a necessary sunnah we need to resurrect. Because that's the whole point. I mean, what is the purpose of having mu'akha? A stranger comes to town. He doesn't know even how to get around. He doesn't know the ins and outs of the city. A convert comes, he doesn't even know the social life of a Muslim. He doesn't even know how to pray and fast. He needs not just social company, he needs support. He needs emotional and physical support. He needs somebody to just sit down and tell him what to do. And wallahi, this is something that we need to resurrect in our times. That we need to pair together. We should have families adopt, let's say, you know, meaning it's this type of adoption, right? We should have families or people just volunteer and say, okay, uh, this is going to be my, if you like, mu'akha. I'm going to take this as my akhi or my ukhti, right? The sister should adopt the, the sister converse and vice versa. It should be done because it's something that the Prophet ﷺ continued to do throughout his life. Up until the very end, even after Fatih Makkah, which shows it wasn't something that was temporary, and it is something that we should also think about as a uh, community. It also shows that some of the benefits we get from this issue of, uh, of Mu'akha. It really shows that for any society to grow, to develop, there needs to be strong bonds cemented between them. And we believe that there are no bonds that are stronger than the bonds of religion. 
These are the strongest bonds because the people of a religion, they share many things in common that really define a lot of things. Most importantly, your ethics and your values. Most importantly, your outlook on life, right? That is shared by the people of one religion. The way you view the world is shaped by your religion. So uh, we believe, therefore, that these bonds are something that should be uh, strengthened and should be, in fact, the Quran tells us that this is the strongest bond. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةَ Right? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةَ This is the strongest of all bonds. And when you look at this early society of Muslims, no society in the history of mankind has been as selfless, as generous to strangers as this group of people. Think about it, right? Even blood brothers would not do for their blood brothers what the Ansar did for the Muhajirun. Isn't this true? I mean, think about the stories that we just heard now. Even blood brothers would not do this. But the Ansar did it and Allah praised them from above the seven heavens by saying, they did it genuinely from the heart. It's one thing to do it. And Allah says their hearts were pure when they did it. Never in the history of humanity have we found this type of example of selflessness, of genuinely giving for the sake of the other and not for the sake of yourself. And it is impossible for any society to achieve such standards without having these bonds. And that's what the Prophet established as soon as he moved to uh, Medina. Also realize that uh, one of the things we learn is that the true leader, the Prophet in this case, cannot just give general advice and leave it at that. Rather, the Prophet implemented this decision. How so? By choosing the two people one after the other. Because he knew each one of the Muhajirun better than anybody else. And so he knows who is the most qualified to be the brother of this particular Muhajir. And therefore, the real leader is not just theory, he's also practice. The real leader isn't just talk, he's also action. And the Prophet literally sat down, and Sayyidina Malik says, I forgot to mention this, that he did this pact or this mu'akha in our house. What does it mean, our house? Scholars say, uh, probably Anas meant, in his area of Medina, Fidarina, meaning in our area of Medina, because he didn't have the masjid. And so Anas ibn Malik is saying he did this mu'akha in our area of Medina, which means he literally sat down and one after the other people are coming and he's pairing people uh, together. And this shows us that the Prophet was a very uh, practical, a pragmatic visionary, not just uh, somebody talking theoretically. Uh, it also shows us the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in gradually formulating the laws of the Sharia. Ah. The Sharia, ah, as we all know, came down bit by bit. It didn't just come down all together. And this is one more example, that in the beginning, when the Muhajirun don't have any family at all, the Ansar becomes literally family. And there's only even going to be inheritance between the two. Then what happens? Allah Azza wa makes it easier. And once more and more people convert and they have genuine family, the Muhajirun get married and they have their own kids now, right? Slowly but surely they have family. Now Allah Azza wa Jal changes the laws of inheritance and it is now what we know as the laws of inheritance. Therefore, for that generation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed that generation to experience the Sharia ah in a gradual, in a piecemeal manner. We all know the prohibition of wine didn't come down overnight. It came down in four different segments. Four different bit by bit. It took a while to get them to the prohibition. Question, if a convert comes and says, why can't I use this four-step program to give up alcohol? Why don't you allow me a little bit at a time? Give me one year for each of these, like in those days. Right? Hmm? If somebody were to say this, why can't we do it? Or is it even allowed to do this? The response is by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam, there is no difference of opinion, that a new convert is not allowed the uh, privileges that those Sahaba had. Why? One simple reason. The Sahaba were the first society of Muslims. They have no role model. They have no support. It's going to take a while for them to get to the level of perfection. When a convert converts to Islam, he has a society already up and running. He has a community already exemplifying the Sharia. Ah. And therefore, you cannot give him the laxities that the first generation had. 
right? And therefore, we will say to this uh, person, thanks but no thanks, it's a nice question you have, and mashallah, you're going to become a faqih, it looks like, for that question, you're really going deep into the sharia, you know, usul al fiqh, you're going to start maneuvering your way, but uh, you're not going to be given this concession, you are required, uh, yani so much so that we know that uh, the convert technically should start praying immediately, even if he doesn't know Fatiha, he will just say it in English or he will hold it in his hand. Whatever he needs to do to get by, but he needs to start praying immediately, right? Even if he's forgiven for the details that he doesn't actually know, Subhan Rabbi al he can hold it or he can say it in English, you know, all praise be to God. Whatever he needs to to get by until he memorizes. But technically all of the laws of Islam come. Now, of course, it's a different story that we as a community are wise in, you know, gradually telling him what to do. But... Technically, the Sharia is applicable upon him instantaneously at his uh, conversion. Other uh, wisdoms that, other wisdoms that we uh, benefit from over here. Uh, of course, needless to say, we already said this last week. Uh, the status of the Ansar, the status of this group of people whom Allah Azza wa Jalla praises in the Quran in multiple verses, and that is why loving the Ansar is a sign of faith and iman. Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said that Ayatul Imani Hubbul Ansar. The sign of Iman is to love the Ansar. Wa Ayatul Nifaq Bughdul Ansar. And a sign of hypocrisy is to hate the Ansar. It's a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, right? And uh, therefore, anybody who loves the Ansar, this is a sign of Iman. And anybody who hates the Ansar, our Prophet ﷺ has said something else about them. And in fact, so much is the blessings of the Ansar, the Prophet ﷺ even said to them that if I could, I would give up my lineage and be a part of you. When did he say this? After the Fatih Makkah. And he said, لَوْلَ الْهِجْرَ لَكُنْتُمْ رَأَنْ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ Were it not for the Hijrah, I would have considered myself one of the Ansar. I can't change biologically that I'm Qurashi. I cannot change that I'm from Mecca. Were it not for the fact that I come from Mecca, I would have considered myself one of the Ansar. وَلَوْ سَلَكَ النَّاسُ وَادِيًا وَسَلَكَ الْأَنصَارُ وَادِيًا لَسَلَكْتُ وَادِي الْأَنصَارِ If all of mankind went in one direction, and the Ansar went in another direction, I would choose the direction of the Ansar. This is what the Prophet is saying. The, the amount of praise he gave to the Ansar, and these are in our Bukhari Muslim textbooks, not in some obscure. These are like the standard books of our faith, right? The amount of praise he gave to the Ansar is in, indeed unprecedented, even though the Muhajirun have a degree above them, subhanAllah, right? Even though the Muhajirun have a degree above them, and that is why whenever Allah praises the Ansar, subhanAllah, every time he praises the Muhajirun before them. Every time Allah says in the Quran uh, that was Sabiqun al Awaluna min al Muhajirin wal Ansar. The first peoples to embrace Islam from the Muhajirin and the Ansar. He begins with the Muhajirin, then the Ansar. Laqad tab Allahu al Nabi wal Muhajirin wal Ansar. Allah has repented upon the Prophet and the Muhajirin and the Ansar. Again, the Muhajirin before the Ansar. SubhanAllah, even in the ayah that Allah praises the, 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 the Ansar, and that is Allah, the, the saying of Allah, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّعُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانِ This is the highest praise of the Ansar in the Quran, Surah Al-Hashr, verse 9, right? Uh, those who prepared the house, that's the praise of the Ansar. The verse right before it mentions, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ muhajirin. The verse right before it. And so Allah Azza wa Jal always gave precedence to the Muhajirun over the Ansar. And if the Ansar have been praised in such a high manner, where does that leave the uh, Muhajirun? And that is why uh, when the Ansar were praised so highly, that is why the Sahaba, the, the, the Muhajirun, became so scared that they might take our rewards. Ya Rasulullah, are they going to take our rewards? And the Prophet said, no, they will not take your rewards as long as you continue to praise them and make dua uh, for them. Uh, so this is the issue of the Mu'akha. Inshallah, we'll uh, stop here, open the floor for Q&A. And next Wednesday, inshallah, we will begin talking about a very significant portion of the seerah, a very important uh, portion of the seerah, and that is uh, the constitution of Medina, which is a, uh, a novel idea, which was unprecedented in Arabia. Some even say unprecedented in the world, uh, in its scope, 
in its uh, guarantee for freedom of religion, and this is really absolutely true, the way that the Prophet ﷺ formulated the state, the Madani state, that he allowed the Yahud, he allowed the Muslims to do this, he allowed, he mentions the Mushrikeen as well in this contract, the amount of freedom that was given and the type of republic that the Prophet ﷺ brought forth in Medina, some have even said it is completely unprecedented in, in, in human history, and we'll talk about uh, the concept of this constitution and the importance of the constitution and also some of the controversies over this uh, constitution or treaty of Medina, inshallah, that will be next uh, Wednesday. Also, before I forget, also the announcement, uh, I was I told to make two announcements before I open the floor for Q&A. The first announcement uh, on Saturday evening at 7 p.m., 7 p.m., right, over here? At 7 p.m., uh, we will be doing a, uh, what is the title of it? Was a, huh? a bonfire event. Uh, and uh, it will be done here on our grounds at MIC. Uh, halal marshmallows, inshallah, uh, will be arranged. Don't worry. Uh, and uh, I have been asked to give a talk. So I will be talking about uh, signs of the Day of Judgment. Signs of the Day of Judgment we'll be talking about, uh, inshallah, at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, also, Saturday, this, is this Saturday? Saturday. Saturday or Sunday? Saturday. I thought it was, you emailed Saturday. The no, the La Hacienda. No, Sunday. Sunday? Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, on Sunday, uh, all day long from 11 a.m. up until 10, 10 p.m., all day long Sunday, uh, we are having our second Zabiha uh, day because we made the mistake of having Zabiha night, and mashallah, we had like 200 people in the restaurant. So, so 300. Huh? 300 people. Uh, by the way, we forgot to announce, but the manager of the Chinese restaurant. Uh, profusely apologized. He said he was expecting 30, not 300. Uh, and so next time he will be prepared. He said, next time you do it, I will have triple the amount. He told me this myself. He said, triple the amount of uh, staff and, uh, and, and cooks. He apologized profusely. I guess it was uh, our problem as well that we didn't know what to expect. And so he thought 30 people would be coming. So he didn't have the quantity of chefs and people. So those of you who went, you know, it was a long line, but mashallah, the food was worth it, I would say, alhamdulillah. Um, so this time, uh, the manager, the restaurant manager has basically given us the entire day. So we can take our time, whoever wants to go for lunch, whoever wants to go for late lunch, early dinner, late dinner, the entire day the restaurant will be serving Zabiha. Uh, and this is La Hacienda, but not the La Hacienda that I thought it was, which is in downtown. This is the La Hacienda on Forest Hill, Irene, and Germantown. The Sorry, the La Hacienda, Forest Hill, Irene, and Poplar. Poplar. Yeah, Forest Hill, Irene, and Poplar. The Mexican La Hacienda restaurant will be serving uh, Zabiha all day, so you don't even have to ask for Zabiha, right? It's just, no, you have to ask. Oh, you have to ask it's for open it. To the general public. Okay, so you have to tell your waiter you want the, the Zabiha. So it'll be cooking Zabiha uh, separate, then I thought it was all of it. Okay, so that's the second announcement. With that, we open the floor for questions. Oh, third announcement. Yalla, bismillah. Okay, so we take two, three questions, and inshallah, we'll do that. Two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that the Mu'akhab should be uh, re instantiated. Uh, I was wondering, did any of the Sahaba after Rasulullah passed away, did any of them uh, implement the Mu'akhab? The scholars say there was no need for them to do so. But we in our times are at a time of. Uh, uh, there is no up and running society. We are more in this need of Mu'akha because the society around us is not the up and running society of Medina. So, in that, we, I don't know of any type of Mu'akha that was done in the time of the Sahaba. Uh, Allahu A'lam. So, the second question is regarding the uh, uh, suggestion to converts that they begin to pray in their native tongue. Uh, and I was wondering if you would make uh, that a general rule for people who don't speak Arabic, even maybe children, when they begin to learn. No, no, we don't, we don't make this a general rule at all. None of the scholars ever made this a general rule. As for converts praying in their tongue, this is something that classical books of fiqh have mentioned. That what do you expect, if somebody takes the shahada right now, how do you expect him to pray Isha with us? And it's not even possible for him to read Fatiha. So what's he going to do? Well, either he doesn't pray, which doesn't make sense, or he prays and we just tell him, say whatever you can. So much so that if he doesn't even know Fatiha, he just says, praise be to God. Praise be to God. That's fine. 
he'll be forgiven until he can learn Arabic. The same cannot be said of us who are Muslims or our children who are born into our households. We teach them the Fatiha in Arabic. We teach them the, the rituals in Arabic. Uh, our Salah must be performed in Arabic. The Quran and the Adhkar of Salah. None of the scholars of Islam ever allowed uh, them to be perform, performed in any other language. How about du'a we may The du'a may be done in any language. The du'a may be done in any language. Question from the sisters. Even in fard. Even we went over this long time with the sisters in their fiqh class. Yes, even in fard. Yes, go ahead. So uh, the sacred months are uh, Shawwal, Dhul Qa'da, and Dhul Hijjah, and Rajab. Uh, sorry, uh, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. These are the sacred months. Rajab is the only one that's separate. Rajab is the only one that is separate. The other three are connected together. Uh, the Zawaj of Aisha took place, uh, it is said the actual Aqd took place before. Uh, the hijra and then the bina or the conservation took place after the hijra. Okay, brothers, yes. Give comments, please. Uh, the first one is calling the state of Islam republic. Republic is a word uh, in the way of a government that is doesn't apply to Islam. Well, life al-haqiqa. To be honest, the word republic is vague, and it is. It is okay to call it a type of federation or republic. And when we talk about the constitution next week, uh, uh, when we talk about the when we talk about when we talk about the constitution of Medina next week, it is actually not incorrect to call it a type of republic. These terms, of course, can be defined differently, and uh, a republic is a type of state that it could apply if you want to call it state even the word state is not mentioned these are all english terms so uh, there is an expression in arabic uh, there's a, there's an expression in arabic which you should be familiar with la mushahata fil istilah you know this phrase la mushahata fil istilah but there is no istilah for republic uh, that's the point it's as we define it hatta dawla hatta istilah dawla of course, this is something even which is modern, which... So actually, this is evidence against you. Second point. Second point, uh, you mentioned that some man of Pharisee was of old age, and that's an excuse for hijab, which is... لا, لا, I said two reasons, أخي. كن دقيق معي. One of them, I said, مشي الحال كان رجل عجوز في السن. Right? Wallahi, in the Shafi'iyya, in the Shafi'iyya, there is a qawl in the Shafi'iyya that there is a farq between the, the one who has shahwa, the one who has no shahwa. And this is a qawl. But the more important one is that this was before the hijab. Third point, bismillah. Uh, the third point is about, about the gradualty of, uh, of uh, alcohol, allowing or not allowing. Um, the Sharia, in general, it did not come down in one piece. It came, uh, it came down in gradual. That does not mean it's gradual in application. It's gradual in legislation, which is God can do that. Can allow it for a period of time and then will stop allowing it. However, for the Muslims themselves, whether they're new converts or, or, or they're Muslims all their life, the application has no gradual in it. Not even in that time when those ayat come down. The Muslims that just just converted did not go back to the you know the first idea of alcohol halal or not, um, being good or not. So the application is absolutely like a sword. When it comes down, that's it. The streets flooded with good wine. But the legislation, which is not in our hands, in God's hands. Yes, it came down on the whole Sharia. That is what I said, that it came down over piecemeal. That's what I said. It didn't come down in bulk, it came down gradually, bit by bit. So alcohol was not prohibited overnight, it was gradually prohibited. Sah? It was prohibited. And the last ayah, when it came down, it was prohibited. I mean, I think, I think you're being a bit technical here. It wasn't prohibited overnight. In the beginning, Allah Azza wa Jal warned them against drinking. Then Allah warned them against certain timings of drinking. And then Allah Azza wa warned them against drinking, period. So I'm calling it gradually. Uh, and 
I mean, again, I think you're being a little bit technical here. The importance of this issue is not for that particular issue. Now we find Muslims that uh, won elections and, and they're, they're getting into government in some countries. They are asking for some relief of some uh, ayat and hadith. Some Muslims are now ruling in Egypt. They're saying uh, alcohol should be allowed in some areas. Wallahi, akhi, this is a deep issue. We're raising kind of sort of, I think you're kind of sort of taking us all the way back there. We're over here in Memphis, Tennessee. Let's deal with our local issues, inshallah. Zakallah khair, Sheikh. I didn't say this, but I think your audience is in Egypt, so you should, you should uh, tell them that, inshallah. Final question before we give it over to our guests that are here. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. The uh, Muakhal, you said that, you know, the Prophet was, you know, matched everyone together very appropriately. How did he know the Ansar? I mean, he didn't know the people of Medina that well, so how did he know who was best suited to each other? Either we can say that uh, this was from Allah Azza wa Jalla, or we can say that he got the, the mashwara or the, the, the feedback from the people. Again, as with most instances of the seerah, for every one thing reported, there are 20 things that are unreported. You know, and this is the reality of any life. How much do you know, as I mentioned back in the first day of the seerah, I said, how much do you even know of your father's life, of your grandfather's life, right? Yani, for one incident, even that incident, how much details do you know? So if this is the case of people we have lived with, how about 14 centuries ago? These details are history books are silent about. Uh, so we have some... Yeah, but, but all 50 of them? I mean, this is a good question that even I ask myself, by the way. Like, uh, yeah. So some of them, of course, he would know, but all, all of the 50, and it's Allahu Alami, Imma Wahya, Imma Mashwara. So Iqbal if you can announce the, that.